We know that, that animals are liable to develop stereotypes uh, in highly unnatural conditions where, where their whole behavior, whole level of behavior is stressed. And what they do is pick on a pattern um, that's very usual in their normal lives, which they, which they can't actually uh, release because the right stimuli aren't there. But they have a kind of urge to do it, so they have to start doing it um, in a rather frantic way. I think we at one point have perhaps talked about weaving coming from the pattern of, of normal grazing. Now a foal, when it's, when it's got a shock or something, rushes straight away to its mother and suckles for two or three seconds, not long enough to get milk out. This is the subject of a good study by, I think it's Cameron Linklater in New Zealand. And we saw it in Venezuela too. We, if we looked at suckling times, we got a very good bump at two or three seconds and then a gap. There just wasn't suckling for 15 or 20 seconds. No, there was suddenly suckling at 45, 50 seconds, a minute, a minute, 10 seconds. That's a feeding bout. But the other ones are just get tit in the mouth for uh, security. And there's some suggestion that there's actually a pheromone around the mare's udder. That's, it's all a bit under investigation at the moment that calms them down. But anyway, be that hard as it may, when, they, when they're frightened, they run to mum and it tit in mouth. So you shut them in by themselves in bad old-fashioned weaning methods. Uh, and they haven't just lost the opportunity to drink, they've lost their comfort. So they go for a point on the, on the manger usually, which is why it's called crib biting, or a protuberance, a stone that comes out at about the right level and they, that becomes what they latch onto to suck, that's their sort of baby's dummy. Um, and you don't usually see them do it because the moment you open the door they stop doing it. Um, so they do it when they're alone. So you don't realise they're, they're, they're developing this. And then they go back to doing it whenever they're highly stressed again. So if you bring them in to break them in, for example, that's when they'll start doing it all over again because that becomes their, their reaction to stress. Like smokers stop stroke, uh, smoking, but in moments of huge stress, it's when they start again, or nail biters, or, yeah? Um... Repetitive movements of the sort they do release beta endorphin, which is like morphine. So this is actually quite pleasurable, so it's rewarding at the same time. Um, actually at the levels that they're bringing it out, and because it's associated with cortisol, it's more of a reaction to stress. But there is a perception that they're calming themselves by doing it and that means they're coping with a situation which is otherwise disagreeable. That sounds, it sounds quite reasonable when you see <coughs> and you see that blank look in the horse's eye um, and you think well it's not doing itself much harm and it's sort of lulling itself with a Chute of morphine. Um, it's there are people who now say that this is a, a coping mechanism, so it's all all right. I, I don't know whether we'd actually call uh, being heroin dependent a coping mechanism or not, or being alcoholic being a coping mechanism. They actually become. I. Uh, self drug addicts addicts they need they need to do this when they're doing self mutilating behavior there are horses that turn around and bite their flanks or they bite their chests they'll actually tear bloody great holes in them i don't know how you if that's 
coping what is not coping, please. And they do that, they get to that stage because they can't feel pain because they're drugged up with morphine. So they just go on doing it. What is, if that's coping, what is not coping? What should we call it instead? It's a, it's a poor welfare, bad welfare. As it says in the, now in the regulations for farm animals, uh, the European ones, it's not actually law yet, but they say that animals should be allowed to perform their natural behaviour patterns. Well, people are going to draw the line at doing lots of sexual behaviour, but um, we do know that all stereotypes come from thwarting natural behaviour. So, in other words, it's an indication that the, the animal is not able to do its natural behaviour. And they'll they do now, even in pigs, for example, an excessive level of tail biting is regarded as bad, bad management. We don't seem to have that concept in horses. You can have uh, race horses, stereotypes. Well, stable vices run normally about 20%. If you look at other stereotypes that are not so harmful to the horse, they don't, they don't like sucking their tongues or just doing funny repetitive movements. They don't usually count those as stable vices. So uh, you, you're often talking about a 50% level. This would com be completely unacceptable in factory farm am animals. And it's accepted in horse life. I, I think that's appalling. Appalling. So, um, how does a cribbing collar help? It doesn't. We've known that for 50 years. What would you say to horse owners who say, oh, my horse will colic if I don't put a cribbing collar on him? The colic isn't to do... They don't actually swallow the air. That's what McGreevy showed quite a long time ago. Um, they swallow minimal amounts of it. They, they just get a bubble in their esophagus and they move it up and down. Um, but they don't actually swallow the air. The colics are because they're stressed. The, a stereotype is an indicator of high levels of stress. Yeah? It's an indicator that you've got uh, a lot of beta endorphin uh, and a lot of uh, cortisol normally, well ACTH, which it provokes cortisol. Uh, and these have sequelae. The, uh, they, they lower fertility, uh, they lower resistance to disease, raise he healing times, and they disturb digestion. Digestion is always disturbed. So, Repetitive colics actually are less to do with feeding than they are to do with stress. And again, we, we just don't seem to have these concepts very clear, although the, the, the biochemical pathway is absolutely clear. So when you say that, there's always going to be horse owners who say, well, my horse colics when he doesn't have a cribbing collar on, and when he does have a cribbing collar on, he doesn't colic. What explains that? Is that selective memory, or...? Uh, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. I'd like some figures on that. Um, we do know that the moment you take the collar off, you get a rebound. How is... It, if, if this is to do with stress, which we know perfectly well it is, how is it going to help a horse's level of stress to be prevented from feeding? How is it to have pressure there all the time. How is it going to help his stress level? It's not. So what can you do? Turn him out. At the first sign of it, turn him out and in company. We know the three things that, that make horses sane, mentally and physically. Liberty, company and time grazing. And 
a, a lot of the time people say uh, it doesn't actually uh, it doesn't actually cure them. Um, no, it doesn't cure them. Uh, you don't get cured of allergies either. It's like it's like being allergic to a stable. If you put it in a stable, it'll start doing it again. But as long as it's out of the stable, it doesn't do it. Yeah. And it can take... Um, if you catch a stereotype when they first start doing it, like you first start to see the horse doing a bit, bit of a weaving movement, Mm, at moments of high stress, when like when the food is arriving, um, and you take preventative measures, he hasn't actually had time to develop an addiction to this. But once he's well addicted, it's going to take him a long time to uh, to calm down. But they do. But they do. A year. So what should people do in the meantime? If they turn the horse out and it still wants to crib, what should they do in the meantime? Uh, nothing. Reduce uh, high energy foods because they, um, they make it worse. Try to, try to have them grazing because all the time they're grazing, they're not performing the stereotype. If they're not performing the stereotype, they're not treating themselves with beta endorphin. So you're actually reducing their level of, of um, dependence on this act. Uh, the other thing I usually advise, and it, it helps an awful lot, is to have a, a couple of playful colts there. And people are frightened that they'll actually start doing it, but they don't. They, they play and they engage the other horse in play, and that's quite fun for them. So I think it's, it's a bit like drug addiction in people, apparently one of, the, one of the things is not just reducing the dependency, it's replacing the pleasure with other pleasures, so that physical activity is very, very often used for drug, drug addicts, because you feel good after physical, you, there's bits of beta endorphin in that too, yeah? So if you can get this horse moving and doing, and probably, mm, reducing stress in work, yeah, how you're exercising him, yeah, it, it, acute stress triggers cribbing, yeah, uh, and any, even when you recover a horse completely from, from stereotyping, moments of acute stress, they'll go back to it, yeah. Like a, ho a horse I knew that, that um, arrived at a rescue centre, but pretty badly beaten up and with bloody great holes in her withers and her, from a badly fitting back. She'd been in riding school and hitting her and stuff. It was, it was awful. And she's now completely recovered, but every time you go, to, you raise the saddle to put it on her, that was her stereotype, sticking her tongue out and biting it, mm, 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 like that. She just does that in that precise second. And she, this is years and years and years later. She knows perfectly well the, the, the saddle doesn't hurt anymore. They've done a lot of recovery work so that she accepts the saddle well and all that. But it, even if she's loose, she's loose. She can walk up to the, with the saddle. She doesn't say, no, don't put me on it, put that on me. But they raise it up and she goes... Mm. It gives me this thing every time. Yeah. And there's lots of things that can, that can stress them. I've known horses that, um, that started, one started weaving, uh, and one started putting its tongue out and doing that on the side of the door rubbing it on the side of the door. Um, they were in a big riding school. The, both their owners had um, didn't ride awfully well, but they rode them around the countryside and they went out. They just went out hacking and had a nice time with them. And then they both got ideas. These were at different times, but it was in 
happen to be in the same line of thought. Um, they both got ideas that they wanted to do Doma Vaquera, which is very fast, sort of Western style, but Spanish. Very fast movements uh, and usually very punitive training. And these horses came back well trained, but the guys didn't ride well enough to ride them. And both those horses, a month later, started stereotyping. And they were back in the same box they'd lived in for years, in the same conditions they'd have lived here, nothing had changed, only the work. So it was the stress of work that was actually making them stereotype, which is very interesting to me.